بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في العالم Do you have any comment or question about what we discussed last week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't read that. So about what we discussed in the class, if you have any question, otherwise we can continue. Basically what we said was that Allama Tabatabai Rahmatullah wanted to explain that although everything is a creation of God, but we can distinguish between two aspects. One is the existential aspect, and from that perspective, it's created by God. The other aspect is the moral side of it, which is where we connect the action to the agent, to the human being who is doing the action. From this side, it can be moral or immoral, can be good or bad. The connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not determine whether this action is moral or immoral. It's the person who decides whether this action is going to be a good action or bad action. Because everything which is created by God is good. But when we say this action was wrong or bad, this is not because it is created by God. If it is created by God, it's good. This is another aspect and this is based on the agent, on the doer of the action. And Allah then referred to some verses of the Quran about uh, bad actions being from us. And then he shifted to bad events, unpleasant events. And wanted to say these unpleasant uh, events are also because of us. Whatever sayyah comes to you, it's from you, because of you. Of course, he explained that because Allah may create something, for example, an earthquake. Because of this earthquake, I may lose my house or my health. This negational side is what I say, it's bad. But this is not what Allah has created. Allah has created earthquake. It's for me that this is bad because I have lost something. So what is bad is negational. What has been created by God is something positive. Okay. I mentioned what I think to be the case. So I don't want to repeat, you know. <laughs> then we move to the hadith from Imam Raza alayhi salam. And in particular, I very much love the, this sentence that Imam says, "Ma asabaka min hasanatin fa min Allah, wa ma asabaka min sayyatin fa min nafsik, wa dhalika anni awla bi hasanatika mink, wa anta awla bi sayyatika minni." If you remember, according to what was my understanding, I said both. Good and bad actions are creation of God. But when it comes to bad action, we are responsible. We cannot blame God. Although God is involved. Because He is the ultimate cause. God is involved. But He is not responsible. I mean morally. 
although from a philosophical point of view, he is also responsible. And you can ask him, why did you let this happen? Why did you create this person who did this? But he has all the answers, and if there is anything wrong, we have to accept the responsibility. But if there is something good that we have done, most of credit goes to God. Although we can praise the doer, but because the doer, his existence, his power, everything is from God, so most of the credit goes to God. And this hadith confirms that. It says, Anni awla bi hasanatika mink. Means you have a role in hasanat, I have a role, but your role is very little. My role is more. But when it comes to sayyat, your role is more. Wa anta awla bi sayyatika minni. So, in a real sense, not in a metaphoric sense. In a real sense, everything good comes from God. Everything good comes from God. And everything which is bad, in the sense of either bad action, it starts from us. Or even if you remember, I said even about unpleasant things, I said, it's up to us to make them constructive or destructive, good or bad, positive or negative. I can make a tragic event, hasana or sayya. And this is also from us. If we make it sayya. Again, everything good is from God. Everything good is from God. You know, it's like, for example, if there is light here, it is from God. If it is darkness, it's because we have turned away from God. So darkness is from God. Light is, sorry, darkness is from us. Light is from God. It's real. It's not metaphoric. Anything positive is from God. Anything negative is because we are far from God. We have turned away from God. Anything negative. Yeah. Because we are also created by Him. Can you do it without God? But God can do it without you. So his role is greater. No. No, no, because... No, no. In the case of sins... We are to take the responsibility more. No. I'm not talking about ontological point of view. About the responsibility, about blameworthiness and praiseworthiness. No, it's not double. But because Allah has created me and I've given him ability, Allah has more role. But then it comes to sin, again, my body, my prayer, everything is from Allah, but here Allah has given another role. Yeah, but no, it's not double sin. It's like darkness. If you have light now, where does this belong to? To God. If there is darkness, it's not from God. God has created you, has given you ability, everything. But you have misused everything that God has given you and ended up with darkness. So you cannot say God is more responsible than me. Yes, God is responsible because God has created you and has given you free will. So he must have a good reason why he has given you free will. But you are more responsible in the sense that you have to be blamed. 
with the darkness. It's it's like, for example, when you are doing good action, you are not doing something big. This is what you have to do. This is something natural. If you do something bad, this is not natural. You know, it's like, for example, if we have the best school, best teacher, best textbooks, everything is the best, and then you pass the exam, you shouldn't be very proud of yourself. Because we have given you everything, the best of everything, and you have passed the exam. But if, despite having the best of everything, you fail, here, yes, you have to be disappointed with yourself. You cannot say, in both cases, my role is the same. So when it comes to good, I think our greater role, the greatest role, it's just that we respond to Allah's grace. You don't do more than responding. But when it comes to negative things, you are creative. Do you, do you get my point? If there is corruption and mischief, it is ours. If there is anything good, it's from God. We just have responded to God by letting His will happen. Yes. Who who had question? You? Yes. No, I didn't. I said most of credit. I didn't say all credit. You are also praised, as Imam Raza said, and me. You have a role, but Allah's role is more. I don't deny the role of the agent. This is why it, it, the agent is rewarded. He's praised. He has a role. But his role compared to Allah's role is very little. <laughs> Pardon? The verse... مَا أَصَابَكَ مِنْ حَسَنَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Okay. So, what is the problem? No, for sure we have role. You cannot deny our role. فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Because even you are from God. And not Allah, and not everything is from God. So, as I said, and Imam Raza's hadith confirms, we don't want to say we don't have any role. We have a role and therefore we are judged by God, we are rewarded and punished. We have a role. We have to be accountable because we have a role. But who is to be given more credit if we do something good? We have to give credit to ourselves more or to God? If a person is guided, if a person is pious, is acting morally, it's good. We say, MashaAllah, you are a very good person. We thank him, we encourage him. But most of the credit goes to God. Yeah, but when, we, when you do bad actions, blame goes to you. You cannot say, God put me in this condition. For the good thing, you can say God put me, but for the bad thing, no. Yes, you can blame God. Why did you create me? Why did you give me free will? But this is not something for which you can blame God, because God has given something which is wise. If God had taken away all freedom from us, it was not better. Yeah? It's like... Shaitan, when he was misguided, he said, Bema He wanted to attribute to God. But when he wanted to mis do mischief, he said, La This is a paradox. If it is an action of God, so why you are, you know, threatening God? 
If God is the one who misguides, so says, you know, you have misguided me, let's see how do you misguide other people. You know, but he didn't say this. He said, you misguided me, I am going to misguide other people. If God has no role in misguiding other people, so in your case also he didn't have role. If God misguided you, so you can have not any role. Do you understand? This is a contradiction in shaitan's position. So deep in his mind, he understands that he is responsible. Yes. In good things. Yeah. Independent? No. Mm. Yeah. But, but when it comes to exercise of your free will, God has let this to be decided by you, whether you want to use it in the good way or bad way. Emma shakiran wa emma kafura. Of course, if you do something good, it's by the help of God, if you do something bad, again, it's by the help of God. But it's you who decides whether you want to do good or bad. You, no, the problem is that your hand ha doesn't have free will. So if you, if you slap someone by your hand, you are blamed, not your hand. Because your hand doesn't have free will. But if your, if your brother or your son does something, even if you have asked him, but he has free will. So you are responsible, also he is responsible. Because he has free will. But your hand doesn't have free will. Existentially is dependent, but uh, from the moral side is independent. In the sense that when you exercise your free will, again this exercise is happening in the universe which is under God. But God, inshallah we will explain today, God lets you to be part of the cause and his will comes when the cause is completed. Therefore, his final will only comes after you have made your will. So, in a sense, God lets you to be first. You decide whether you want to go to the good direction or bad direction. But you cannot go to any of those directions without God's will coming. In a later stage. Yeah. Between Jabra and Tafiz. La Jabra wa la Tafiz. Tafiz means that God has delegated everything to us. He has no role. We don't accept that. We said, we said God has a role. No, I said also we praise the person. We said we praise the person, but we give more credit to God. Not that we say you are not involved, you have no role. In both cases, we say God is involved, the person is involved, the person is responsible. But then we go further and we say, although in both cases the person is responsible, but when it comes to good things, more credit is given to God. When it comes to bad things, more blame comes to us. Okay. There are some other hadiths that 
you can read yourself. I don't think they are difficult. Another hadith that I want to reflect because I don't want to read all the hadith. Uh, but some of them are, I think, much more uh, important. After the hadith from Imam Raza, which was narrated by Bazanti, after about two pages, there are some hadith. One hadith is from Taraif, the book Taraif. A man asked Imam Sadiq salam, about Qaza and Qadar. And Imam gave a beautiful answer. Mastata'ta an talum al abd alayh fahuwa min. Whatever you can blame a person for doing it, for which you can blame a person, it's from him. Every action, everything for which you can blame a person, it's from him. And if you cannot blame him for that action, it's from God. For example, Allah says to the servant, لَمَا عَسَيْتَ لَمَا فَسَقْتَ لَمَا شَرَبْتَ الْخَمْرَ لَمَا زَنَيْتَ when it comes to the sins, Allah says, why did you disobey? Why did you transgress? What did, why did you drink wine? Why did you commit fornication? Okay? Can we blame a person for doing these things? Yes. So this is from him. But Allah doesn't say, Lema marizta. Lema kasurta. Why you are ill? Why your height is short? Why, why you are not tall? Lema, lema biyazdasta. Why you are white? Why you are dark? Why you are yellow? Why you are, for example, thin? These are the things that we have no role. If we have role, for example, if I have become ill because of my own bad action, that's another thing. But normally speaking, a person who has cancer, God doesn't ask him why you have cancer. But a person who has committed a bad action, God says, why did you do this action? So, this is a good uh, criteria so that everything for which you can blame a person is from him. Everything for which you cannot blame is from God. But, you have to understand, it doesn't mean that Everything for which you can blame the person, it's not from God. It means it's not solely from God. Only from God. Because, you know, even in the Quran, we had this point that I explained to you before, that everything is from God. But when Imam Sadiq says, those things for which you cannot blame him, it's from God, means solely from God. Those things for which you can blame him, it's not solely from God. He himself also has a role. You understand? So when we say something is fa'lullah, is action of God, here... It means something which is only done by God. Otherwise, you don't have anything in this world which is not an action of God. According to Tawhid Af'ali, everything in this world is an action of God. Then, Allah Metabatabai says that <clears throat> altogether... When we study the hadith which are related to the issue of Jabr and Ikhtiyar, we realize that there are different types of arguments used in the hadith to support the human responsibility, free will of man. One is that 
the fact that Allah commands and prohibits, rewards, punishes, shows that we have to be free. If we were not free, why Allah commands us? You don't command a robot. You don't prohibit a robot. You don't say, if you do this, I will reward you. If you don't do this, I will punish you. You do these things with a person who can decide, who can be free. The other thing is that there are some ideas in the Quran that presuppose free will. It means that without accepting free will, they don't make sense. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِذَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدِ Allah doesn't do any injustice. You know, there is a discussion here, what does it mean that Allah is not Zalam because Zalam is Mubalagha, means the one who does lots of injustice. So when we say Allah is not doing lots of injustice, does it mean that He does a little? Yeah? So the, there are different answers. One answer is that when Mubalagha is negated, then it becomes mubalagha in negation. Okay? Negation of mubalagha becomes mubalagha in negation. So, when you say Allah is not zalam, it doesn't mean He doesn't do lots of injustice. It means that He doesn't do injustice at all. Okay? This is one uh, interpretation. Another interpretation is that because Allah is the Lord of the universe, even the least amount of zulm that He does is a lot. So either He does lots of zulm or He doesn't do at all. You cannot say He does little zulm. With the magnificence of God and the power that He has, it's impossible to do little zulm. You know, if you look at, for example, a king or a president. A king or president, even if he makes one decision, that decision can have impact on lives of many people. It's not like a person without power. If a person who has a high position, for example, you know, if a grand ayatollah, says one sentence negative about one person, that person may lose all his credit. Yeah? So for those who have high position, it's impossible to do little zulm. Either they don't do zulm, or the zulm that they do is great. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says He is not a zalam, it's because impossible to be zalim, just zalim. Just unjust. Either he is free from injustice altogether, or he is very unjust. For example, just the fact that he punishes us if we are not responsible, if we are not possibly capable of preventing that bad action. Do you think this is a little zone? He asked billions of people that you must avoid sin, but they don't have a role. It's a great zone. He sends them to hell when they have no control. In any case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do any injustice. Ma zalamnahum walatin kanu and so on and so forth. If you don't accept free will, this doesn't make sense. If you believe like Ash'arites, that God creates good action and bad action in us, we have no role, we are only the place for His action, the subject, Mozu. Then, this is Zul. Or when Allah says, لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ This is against whom? 
When Allah says, Lillahi mulku samawati wal ardi is against Ash'arite or Mu'tazilite. Mu'tazilite. It's against Mu'tazilite. Because Mu'tazilite, Allah has delegated our voluntary actions to us. This is in contradiction with Lillahi mulku samawati wal ardi. You cannot say Lillahi mulku samawati wal ardi means that there was a time that he had this kingdom, now it's limited. Lillahi mulku samawati wal ardi applies even to our situation today, after creation of human beings. Okay. There are also, yes. What? Mm-hmm. Not, I, I don't think it's very common, but it has examples. It has case similar cases. I, I don't remember example, but. Uh, those who mention this view, they bring some examples. But it's not very common. I think the second answer is better. Like what? I don't think we have it. Because it's either Mubalaga or shows uh, occupation of someone. And occupation also is something which happens a lot. You know, like for example, when if you say this person is Khabbaz or Tamar or... Uh, uh, but if someone, for example, sells uh, bread once, we don't say it's his khabbas. So frequency must be there. Or um, mag, uh, you know, great amount of action and practice must be there. I don't know. As far as I remember, it's not used for Sifat uh, Moshabbah. No, he wants to say that it uh, then Zalam means just Zalim. So Allah says he's not Zalim. But there must be a reason why he doesn't say Vama Rabbuka. Yeah. Why he doesn't say Marabuka Bazaliman? Why he says Marabuka Bazalaman? I think God wants to say that even if I do little Zulm, I am Zalla. No? For him, even little Zulm is too much. Maybe you can consider it as a, another view. You know, like for example, uh, if you have a child, a small child, especially if you have a daughter, okay, three years, four years old, who loved you very much, there is no way to break her heart a little. Either you break her heart <laughs> altogether, or you are kind to her. You cannot say, I break her heart a little. So, in the case of God, God is telling us that any little zolm that I do to you is great. And I don't do great zolm. You know? For someone like God to do little things, you know, unjust, it's great. You know, we have this uh, concept that in some uh, hadith, 
ایاک و ظلم من لا یجد علیک ناصرا الا الله Be very careful not to do injustice to someone who has no helper other than God If someone has a helper other than God, for example, he's a powerful man, he has a, I don't know, a big family or big party to support him, or he can go to the court and make a case against you. It's bad to do zulm, but it's not as bad as when you do zulm to someone who has no one to help him. Okay, this is very bad. You have to be very careful, like your children. Yeah, sometimes like your wife, they don't have anyone to help. So you have to be careful. Now imagine about Allah Himself. If Allah Nawazubillah does zulm, who is there to help us? So even little zulm of Allah is great. وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِذَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدِ Maybe this can be considered the third. Answer. Okay. Another argument that we find in hadith about what? Uh, about free will and against jab is that there are some qualities of God that cannot be understood unless we believe in free will. If you believe in jab or tafiz, we cannot understand them. For example, Allah is Qahar and Qadir. He can defeat everyone who wants to resist against him, stand against him. He overcomes everything. And he's Qadir, he's capable of everything. These qualities like Qahar and Qadir cannot be understood if you believe in Tafiz. Okay? Like Mu'tazila, you believe in Tafiz, then Allah is not Qadir, Allah is not Qaha. You have excluded part of His authority and negated it from Him. <coughs> Allah is Karim or Allah is Rahim. These cannot be understood if you believe in the idea of Jabr. Because if Allah is forcing us to do things and then He punishes us for them, how He can be Karim? How He can be Rahim? Okay? Kahar is against Tafiz. Because according to Mu'tazilat, Allah has delegated everything to us in the human actions which are voluntary. Therefore, He cannot do anything. He has just to watch. But Qahar is the one who has full control. He's in charge. Allah is in charge. He has not retired. Yes. Most of them, we have to study one by one. Yeah, because mercy is a higher state than Adala. If he is mercy, for sure he is just. You cannot be a merciful Zalim. <laughs> Pardon? Can you also say that uh, among all the Sifat of Allah, we have no responsibility upon them to manifest them except Adala? No. Who said that? I've heard it what do you mean? You mean legal responsibility or you mean... So you have to be Razak? Or you can... Yeah, but not necessarily according to justice. You can give them more than what they deserve. I have no role in being I have no role in being among them. No, no, you can be Razak, but when you are Razak, it doesn't mean that you created risk. But you are Razak means in the sense of you are the provider. Okay. 
what we observe justice we don't create justice we observe justice what about mercy no mercy is more than justice indeed mercy starts after justice is achieved before justice is achieved we have not reached the level we talk about mercy mercy comes after that if i owe you some money and i am going to give you this money that i owe you this is justice i cannot say this is mercy this is justice mercy is when i give you more than what i owe you Uh, yeah, this is a very good question. In uh, the science of akhlaq, according to Aristotle and those Muslim scholars who somehow follow Aristotelian approach, they say that when you reach balance in every faculty, then you have justice. So if balance in the faculty of anger and faculty of appetite and faculty of reasoning is achieved, then you have wisdom, bravery, and modesty together. So it means that you have achieved justice in your entire personality. Okay? So for them, this justice is very important. But it seems that this justice is different from that justice that we use in the sense of giving everyone his right. This is a more comprehensive understanding of justice, which includes also my relation with myself and also which includes reaching the highest level of perfection. You know, if justice is just understood in the sense of not depriving from their right, not depriving people from their right, then mercy is not necessary. But, or it has nothing to do with wisdom, for example. But justice in the sense that we explained can include mercy, can include uh, wisdom. So it's different thing. They are related, but they are not the same. So, yeah, so this justice is very comprehensive and you cannot find anything outside this. Because for them, this is a condition of the entire personality of someone. So any other good is included in justice in this sense. And this is much more than justice in a legal sense, that you give someone his right. No more, no less. Is it a characteristic of... I get... Yeah, I got you. Is it a characteristic of a merciful person to create bad actions in someone and then send him to hell? Can you say, call such a person Rahim? No, they cannot say this is okay. No, they say something. Yeah. No, no, you know. Sometimes people say something in some place, but still deep in their mind, they have good understanding. So we want to awaken that understanding which is there. So we say, okay, forget that case, because they have discussed too much about, you know, that case of Hosnogob. Maybe they have lost their common sense. So we say, forget that. Let's go a little bit farther. You understand Rahim? He says, yes. Do you think that someone who is Rahim can create bad action and send them to hell? 
Yes, if he thinks carefully, brings his position from there here, he says yes. But if you can ask him quickly and, you know, don't let him, you know, to bring his ideas and make them consistent. So he refers to his common sense. And he says no. We have many cases like this that we try to ask people to refer to their conscience, to their God-given understanding. Even, you know, in the case of, for example, you know, tabador and etrat and things like this, what we do is that we ask people to go to their, you know, unconscious understanding. And, or for example, you know, in uh, philosophy, you know, there are people who, for example, have said that when we use being for wajib, it has different meaning than when we use it for mumkin. And then ulama mention, you know, some argument against them. And they say, you know, for example, when you say, uh, for example, God is mawjood, does it mean that God is ma'doom? Because this wujud is not the wujud of mumkin. So does it mean ma'doom or you don't mean anything? So if you reflect on that argument, you realize that argument can only work if that person's understanding of Adam is yet untouched. Otherwise, if that person says the same thing that he says about wujud in Adam and says that Adam also has two meanings, when it is used for wajib, it has different meaning from when it is used for mumkin, that argument doesn't work. Many people who study philosophy, they have this question, I don't know if the teachers can give them the right answer, but this is the right answer. That the reason we use this argument is that because we hope that still their understanding of Adam is not touched. Okay. The other thing that we find in Hadith is that we find the concept of istighfar, asking for forgiveness. Or, you know, that a person who does something bad blames himself. We have nafs al things like this in the Quran and in Hadith. Do you think there is a way to talk about forgiveness, asking forgiveness from God? According to Jabr, if there is Jabr, why we should ask for forgiveness? We haven't done anything to ask forgiveness. Yeah? Of course, if a person is really insistent on Jabr, he would say, we are majbur to ask for forgiveness. <laughs> but... As I said, you know, we hope that he is not that much damaged, you know, in his <laughs> conscience. So when we regret and we are remorseful and we say, you know, God, sorry, you know, I am very sorry that I did this. It means that it was my action. <coughs> if I was forced, why should I regret? If I was forced, I had no role. There are also some hadiths that Allah wants to explain at the end of this discussion about attributing misguidance to God. What does it mean that sometimes in the Quran Allah says He misguides? Yodhalullahu Dhalamin, for example. What does it mean? If you remember, we had this discussion before. And we said, when we say God misguides, it doesn't mean that initially, without any reason, God misguides someone. It means that a person who has been offered guidance, and he doesn't pay attention and insists on being misguided, then God lets him to be in that condition, even that condition may become worse. Like fire, you remember the example of fire? We said if there is fire in one floor and you don't extinguish the fire, the fire will expand. But you are responsible. I had a teacher who said, uh, I hear from my teacher, 
So if he leaves us to ourselves, this means misguidance. Why? Because we will be misguided without his support. So you can, in a sense, attribute this misguidance to him. But his role was just not to guide us because he realized that we are not benefiting. No, no. If guidance of God is not there in the sense of we don't have aql and we don't have wahi, so for sure we will go to the wrong direction. Because guidance of God includes also aql. It's hidayat amme, takvini, tashri'i, all these things. So if there is no aql, there is no wahi, so we will be misguided. There is a hadith from Oyunu Akhbar al-Rada from Imam Raza alayhi salam commenting on this verse. Wa tarakahum fi zulumatin la yubsarun. Of course, this verse is very soft because it says tarakahum. But then we have, for example, khatamallah ala gulubihim. That is a stronger. Tarakahum fi zulumatin la yubsarun means God left them in darkness. Yeah? Of course, if you read it from the beginning, you realize that left them in darkness, in a sense means remove their light. Because Allah is talking about them having a light, and then when, pardon? Uh, then Allah takes their light and leaves them in darkness. So, tarakahum just means to leave them in darkness, but before that mentions that God removes the light. So, Imam Raza salam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُوسَفُ بِالْتَارْكِ كَمَا يُوسَفُ خَلْقُهُ Allah doesn't leave anyone, you know, in the sense that, for example, we leave a place and we leave some people. But when Allah knows that they are not returning from kuf and misguidance, Allah says that, sees that they are insisting on misguidance. Allah doesn't send them any more support and help and grace. And leaves them. Allah lets them to be with their own decisions and free will. So, when Allah doesn't help us, it means that he is leaving us to ourselves. <coughs> okay? Like a doctor. Uh, let me first excuse this doctor. <laughs> there is a doctor. This doctor sees that there is a person who is ill. Says, you know, you should not eat this food. You should, you know, take this medicine. This medicine gives him some instructions and prescription. But the ill person doesn't listen. He tells him he doesn't listen. Again, he doesn't listen. At the end, what does the doctor do? He says, goodbye. I leave you with your illness. I have other things to do. Tarakahum fi zulumatin la yubsarun. He leaves them with his illness. Okay, what's your question? Allah 
That light is support. But when they do, you don't use that light, Allah takes it away. Allah sends, for example, Quran. نُنَزَّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ But if someone doesn't benefit, وَلَا يَزَادُ الظَّالِمِنَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِنَا إِلَّا خَسَارَ Yeah. So then he has stopped sending. First he sends. Then when they don't use, he has stopped. لا إن شكرتم لا أزيدنكم ولا إن كفرتم then he doesn't send anymore إن عذابي لا شديد yes okay Gives him back his reason. Gives him or takes him? Takes from him his reason? Not, not easily. I think this is uh, good that you ask this. I think the very last thing that God takes away from a person is his apple. This is the very last thing. And this happens rarely. Because if Agl is blocked and doesn't work, that person is finished. Even many Kofar steal their Agl works so that they may think and come back. You know, even the people of hell they say, "Lo kunna nasma aw naqil ma kunna fi ashab sa'i." Means it still there was possible for them to use their aql. But if a person reaches the level of sealing the heart, or the level of being transformed by being cursed by God. I think if a person is cursed, then you can say, this person no longer can understand. There are some verses in the Quran from which we can argue that the one who is cursed, who doesn't receive any mercy from God, is no longer a rational person. Either it's physically even made into apes, like those who didn't observe the covenant with God, God cursed them, or like the people who are still looking like human beings, but when they are cursed, no chance. They don't receive rahmah, they don't understand. Pardon? No hope. I am sorry. If someone is cursed by Allah, I don't think there is any hope. But if you don't accept this, you know, go and study the verses of the Quran about La'an. And see whether you can accept this or not. This is my understanding. Those who are cursed by God, their heart becomes hard they become like animals they don't receive any guidance from God any support from God therefore there is no return for them the people who killed Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura I was thinking why they did such a brutal thing they could have just killed Imam Hussein and finished everything. There was no need, you know, to do all these crimes. But I came to this conclusion that these people were cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, even Imam Hussein warned some people that if you are not going to support me, go away. Because just to hear my call 
and not answering me is enough to be cursed. Let alone if you want to fight. When they were cursed, then they became like animals, like wolves. They lost their understanding. A person who is mal'oon, you can expect everything from him. Even he can do something that animals don't do, if he is cursed. But most of the people don't reach that level. Therefore, still there is a chance for them to return. So my idea is that the very last thing that God takes away from people is their aql. So that hopefully one day they may think and return. You see, in many verses, Allah even says to the kuffar, don't you think, don't they think, if there, it was not possible for them to think, why you encourage them to think? Why you expect them from, you know, from them to think? So thinking is a great blessing of Allah that Allah leaves it to the latest, you know, possible time. Doesn't take it away soon. It remains as long as possible. Yes. Why? No, when they reach that level, they don't deserve mercy anymore. Because land means not to receive mercy. A person who reaches that level, it means that he doesn't deserve any mer mercy. Because we are to be free and uh, tested. Of course, free will is very important. And we have also to look at the whole system. Otherwise, you know, some people say, why God created those people that he knew that are going to be bad in future? But this is not a good question, because this means that you should remove free will. If you accept free will, this is the cost that some people may misuse the free will. Pardon? Life by itself is a gift, but not always mercy. Like, for example, the people who are in hell. They say to the angel who is the patron of the hell, Ya Malik, alayna rabbuk. They say, please, you know, ask your Lord to finish us, to terminate us. Says no, and nakomma kathun. You have to live here and suffer. La yamutu fiha wa la yahya. He has to. So sometimes to die is mercy. Sometimes you don't die so that you suffer. But to begin with, initially, of course, life is a mercy from God. But for some people, life is to suffer. Can be, yeah, like that. I think he was before you, yeah. Uh -huh. Those who cannot reason, who cannot think, are of two types. Okay? Then we can see which one we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are two types. Some of them, all their life they have been like this. So they never reached the level of understanding. I think these people are not human beings. Legally, we have to treat them as human beings. Okay? 
from fiqhi point of view but from a philosophical point of view these people are not human beings and therefore they will not be judged by god this is my understanding a person who has never had understanding just looks like human beings but there are people who have had understanding then because of some accident some illness a problem started they don't think properly now these people their soul may still remain intact it's a problem that the soul and body do not inter interact properly maybe a person even loses all his memory maybe he's a great alim has spent all his life in studying now he has lost his memory does it mean that for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's no longer alim no he's alim his soul is still alim it's a problem that there is no communication between body and soul between this worldly aspect of him and that side of him so we think that he is not alim but in the sight of allah he is still alim okay therefore those who were able to think they were rational and they lost they will be judged by allah and if they were good people inshallah they will go to heaven but those who never had in their life ability to think i don't think they are going to be judged if if agli is taken away i don't think there is any way of returning it's not that allah's forgiveness is limited, but forgiveness must be wanted if you don't want to be forgiven then you will never be forgiven forgiveness is to forgive those who want to be forgiven those who regret if someone doesn't regret so you cannot no he must regret where it is beneficial otherwise when they are dying everyone regrets when everyone is seeing the angel of death they all regret that is not useful there is only one verse as far as i know that talks about the possibility of asking forgiveness on the day of judgment it's a very beautiful verse but this is for mu'minin when they see their light yawma tara al-mu'minin wal-mu'minat nuruhum yas'a bayna aydihim wa bi'aymanihim okay they say to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rabbana atmim lana nurana waghfir lana they say oh allah please complete our light and forgive us so mu'minin on the day of judgment even ask for forgiveness this is the only verse that i know that talks about possibility of asking forgiveness from god but this is for people who were good people not a person who was always doing mischief and then says allah forgive me that doesn't work but for pious people who have some light and now because of their light they understand that there were things that they were not careful about and they had you know some shortcomings some failure they say atmim lana nurana waghfir lana so this is a bashara that for such people there is possibility of istighfar on the day of judgment yes لمن يشاء لمن يشاء 
No, in the this verse wants to say that with respect to shirk, it's impossible to be forgiven as long as you are mushrik. Okay. If the person then himself leaves shirk and becomes a muvahhid, then this is forgiven automatically. In the case of other sins, it's possible to be forgiven, but it's not guaranteed. Therefore, you have to ask forgiveness. You cannot say, okay, Allah has forgiven everything because it's dunar, before, below shirk, so Allah has forgiven. No, it's not guaranteed. Indeed, if you underestimate your sins and say, my sins are not important because they were below shirk, you will not be forgiven. What are muhaqqarat min dhunub those sins that you say they are not important, they are not significant, God forgives them. These sins will never be forgiven. So, shirk is guaranteed that will not be forgiven unless you give up shirk. Other than shirk is not guaranteed not to be forgiven. But it's not also guaranteed to be forgiven. You understand? It's possible to be forgiven without repentance. Without repentance, it's possible, but it's not guaranteed. This is guaranteed. <laughs> you know, Shirk. Because Allah says, if you avoid shirk, lower than shirk will be forgiven. If it was about Tawbah, so even shirk with Tawbah is forgiven. So, shirk is guaranteed that will not be forgiven. Unless you give up shirk. As long as you have shirk, it's not forgiven. Those which are saqair, Allah says, Allah will forgive them. Unless you make them kabira by insisting on them. That's another issue. But saqair are forgiven if you don't make them kabira. Then there is something between shirk and saqair. It's possible. Yaqfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. It's possible but not guaranteed. Therefore you have to ask forgiveness. Okay? So there are three categories. Do you have a question? In, in uh, that is maghbun man tasawa yawafa huwa maghbun in such cases if the hadith is authentic mal'un is not used in the sense that it is used in the quran which says for example in these cases, if it's authentic hadith, it may mean that he is mal'oon by people. He's someone who is disliked by people or, you know, by good people, by mu'mineen, something like this. Not that someone who doesn't receive any rahmah from Allah. Do you understand the difference? <laughs> by people, by mu'minin maximum. But not in the sense that he becomes like uh, the people who annoyed the Prophet. Therefore, for such people, there is hope of change. Yeah, the Quran says. Yal'anuhumullah wa yal'anuhumullah'inun. 
These are the people that everyone curses them. So the maximum or the highest level of being cursed is when Allah himself curses you. Because Allah is the most merciful one. Sometimes, you know, people curse you, but still the Prophet may not curse you. Sometimes people curse you and the Prophet also curses you, but Allah may not curse you. <laughs> yeah, there were, you know, prophets who cursed their people. And Allah was not happy. Why did you curse them? And one of the things that Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, he said, مَا بُعِسْتُ لَعَانًا Yeah, سَبَّابًا وَلَا لَعَانًا or لَعَانًا وَلَا سَبَّابًا Something like this. Allah has not sent me to curse people. But there were prophets who before Allah cursed their people. The people were destroyed, but Allah was not happy. But when you reach the point that Allah curses you, who is Arhamur Rahim, then everyone curses you. And this person has no future. Like, for example, Prophet Nuh or Prophet Yunus. No, I don't say he himself was cursed, but Allah was not happy. And this is why uh, Prophet Yunus, Fanada, Fizzulumat, Allah, Ilaha, Illa, and. No, I don't say. He cursed his people. He cursed his people. Prophet Nuh also cursed his people. He said, La tazar ala al ardh min al kafirin al dayyara. I'm not saying. Allah was not happy with Prophet Nuh, I don't know. But uh, it seems that with Prophet Yunus, he was not happy because Prophet Yunus then regretted. Yeah, and... Anyway, what he did was not good. It was not the best choice. Therefore, he asked for forgiveness. Anyway, whatever was the reason, what he did was not the best choice. So you say, uh, uh, I don't say there is different. The question is, uh, when I'm saying about Yunus. No, no, I, I told him, I said, about Nuh, I don't say Allah was angry. About Yunus, I said, it seems that Allah was not happy. Because it says, And there are hadiths which says that he realized that it was not uh, right for him. In the case of Nuh, he also cursed people. But maybe it was okay. I don't know. In the case of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he never cursed people. Even in the day of Uhud, when they killed Hamza and many people, they injured the Prophet, broke his teeth, he didn't curse them. Indeed, he prayed for them. He said, Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. He said, Oh Allah, please guide my people. They don't know. Look at his kind heart. First of all, he says, These are my people, qawmi. He doesn't say, These are, you know, uh, Mischief makers, these are, you know, devil people. He says, me, these are my people. If you love me, these are my people. And then wants to bring some excuse for them. He says, For whom are, Prophet says they don't know. The people who knew him for more than 50 years. Because by that time, Prophet was more than 50 years. 
And right from the time of his birth, they knew about him. They knew he's an honest man. He never tells lies. Then for 13 years in Mecca, he was with them. Then few years in Medina. After so many years of knowing him and many years of his message, still he says, فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And you see that, alhamdulillah, many of them later became Muslims. Many of them later embraced Islam. If the Prophet had cursed them, all of them were finished. So you look the difference between our Prophet and our behavior. If I speak to someone for one hour, I say he knows everything and he's not going to be guided. You know, we do Atmama Hujjat in just few minutes with people. But the Prophet said, these people don't know. So there's a big difference, yes. Pardon? Yeah. Okay, so let me just uh, read one more hadith so that we reach the philosophical discussion. The other hadith that we have is Again, from Uyuna Akbar Rida, about Khatamallahu ala qulubihim. Allah sealed their hearts. Imam said, this was punishment that they received because of their kufr. Al khatm huwa tab'u ala qulub al kufar uqubatan ala kufrihim. So it's not that because Allah sealed their hearts, they are kafir. It's opposite. Because they were kafir and they didn't want to change, Allah sealed their hearts. Not that you are not going to use your heart, it's better to be sealed. Yeah? If I give you a TV and you never use it, so I seal it, I say, you know, it's better <laughs> that it is sealed. And Imam Sadiq salam also said about this verse that we had at the beginning. إن الله لا يستحي أن يضرب مثلا ما بعودة فما فوقها فأما الذين آمنوا فيعلمون أنه الحق من ربهم وأما الذين كفروا فيقولون ماذا أراد الله بهذا مثلا يضل به كثيرا يضل it attributes to God يضل به كثيرا ويهدي به كثيرا وما يضل به إلا الفاسقين إمام صادق عليه السلام says that this is a refutation of the idea of those who think that God misguides people and then punishes them. Allah doesn't misguide people and punish them. These are the people who themselves want to be misguided because Allah says, وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ So Allah doesn't misguide innocent people. Allah misguides فَاسِقِينَ So, these people are responsible. Inshallah, we will continue this discussion with a philosophical discussion about the necessity and contingency which relates to human action.